Okay, so uh, this Thursday, um, on the 7th of May, we have our uh, fourth exam as was scheduled every four weeks. We just got off track a little bit, but we've uh, um, picked up the pace and um, covered the material we need to cover. So we will have exam number four this Thursday. Um, it will basically cover uh, all of chapter five uh, that we've covered, five one through five nine. Um, and um, so I'll get that back to you next week and then we'll spend next week getting ready for the final and then um, we'll take our final uh, at the specified time for the final. Um, to uh, watch this video, please don't just watch. Um, I'm going to go through some of the material, practice some problems, pause the video, try the problems on your own, compare your work to my work. Um, I, I am holding office hours uh, uh, during regular class time, uh, 2.30. I, I sit there uh, until people don't have any more questions. Uh, typically, they've been running about an hour. Uh, I'll go to two hours, uh, hour and a half, two hours. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, if you have time and if you have questions, you should uh, uh, log on to the conference. Okay, so we started in section 5.2 um, talking about antiderivatives. So a function f is called an antiderivative of a function little f on a given open interval if f prime of x equals f of x for all x in the interval. So antiderivative, very intuitive, is uh, just a, a function whose derivative is uh, the same as the function I gave you. Um, there's not a whole lot we learned in uh, section 5.2 other than uh, a list of antiderivatives that you don't have to derive, you just should have memorized. Um, they should be fairly intuitive. Um, but we do have this one result here. Um, and so this part A tells us that if we're ever trying to find the antiderivative of a constant times the function, then we can just find the antiderivative of the function and then multiply it by the constant. So um, constants just like you know, that should make sense uh, uh, because when you take the derivative of a constant times a function you just take the derivative of the function and then multiply by the constant. Uh, likewise uh, if you're ever trying to find the antiderivative of a sum of two functions you just find the antiderivative of the first function and add it with the uh, antiderivative of the second function. right? And then um, same thing for the difference. If you were ever trying to find the antiderivative of a difference of two functions, you just find the antiderivative of the first function and subtract the antiderivative of the second function. And there you go, right? And so then really in this section, um, we're trying to uh, make sure that you end up with constants times uh, functions added with other constant times functions so that you're trying to make your antiderivative look like the sums or differences of constant times uh, functions that you already know the antiderivative of. So let's go through some of the uh, basic antiderivatives that you should know. Uh, a power function is when you have a variable uh, raised to a constant power, right? So that's a power function. And um, as long as your exponent is not negative one, the antiderivative is very simple. Uh, you add one to the exponent and divide by the exponent. And you should see that um, why that is, because if we take the derivative of a power function of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, well, then what you would do is you would take this exponent, bring it down. It would then cancel out with the denominator that's here, and you would just get x to the n. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the plus c. And the derivative of the constant would be 0. So um, that wouldn't really, uh, that doesn't change anything. And don't forget your plus c in your answer. That's another common mistake. Right? You know that the derivative of the sine is the cosine. All this is asking is, what do I take the derivative of to get the cosine? So the answer is just the sine of x plus c. And you know that the... Uh, derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, so if I want to end up with just the sine, then I need to have this extra negative in front, so that um, when I end up with the negative sine, I make it just the positive sine. 
you know that uh, the derivative of the secant is the secant tangent. So the function I take the derivative of to get the secant tangent is the secant of x. You know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Um, so then what do I take the derivative of to get e to the x? Well, it's the same function, e to the x, but don't forget the plus c. Now, um, when, you're, when you do have a power function that is x to the negative 1, then you can't use the power rule because um, if you add 1 to the exponent, you uh, uh, get an exponent of 0, and you can't divide by 0. Right, so can't use that rule. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't give you something that's meaningful. Um, but in this case, you should know that uh, w you should remember that when you took the derivative of the natural log, you ended up with one over x. So then, what do I take the derivative of to end up with one over x? Well, the natural log of x would be good, but we want the most general one, so we put it in absolute values. And so. Then when I give you an antiderivative, if it's not um, uh, sums or differences of uh, of uh, uh, basic functions, uh, constants times basic functions, then um, we have two techniques. That's all we're learning in this class. There's no product rule. There's no quotient rule. There's no chain rule. There is only um, two techniques. One technique is uh, rearrange algebraically um, your uh, integrand so that it looks like sums or different sums and or differences of constant times ba basic functions um, or u substitution. In section 5.2, we hadn't talked about u substitution, so section 5.2, we're just doing algebra to make what we have look like uh, sums and or differences of constant times basic functions. Now, um, this doesn't look like that. So then what we're going to do is do some algebra. Okay, so again, uh, some al the algebra that we do here is we rewrite this as x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus x to the negative 2 thirds. Right? The denominator, we write it so that we can use our rules of exponents as x to the negative, uh, I'm sorry, x to the 1 third. More than one way to do this. Uh, but then this becomes... Um, uh, now, what you learned in arithmetic is that you can break this one fraction up into multiple fractions, x to the fourth over x to the one third, plus two times x to the third over x to the one third, um, minus uh, x to the negative two thirds over x to the one third, right? And then you can use your rules of exponents that say, that when you are dividing two uh, exponential expressions with the same base, you can write them using a single base by just subtracting the exponents. And so 4 minus 1 third, 12 thirds, 12 thirds minus 1 third is 11 thirds, x to the 11 thirds. Uh, plus 2, 3 minus 1 third, 9 thirds minus 1 third, 8 thirds. And then um, negative two thirds minus one third is negative three thirds. That's x to the negative one. Okay. So then this uh, antiderivative, let me change my color so that this antiderivative becomes the antiderivative of sums of power functions, right? So this is x to the 11 thirds. Uh, plus 2x to the 8 thirds uh, minus, and this x to the negative 1 so that it matches what's on the table, that one is better to write it as 1 over x. Okay, and then 1 over x, and then dx. And now my antiderivative I find by simply adding 1 to the exponent. 3 thirds is the same thing as 1, so you're just adding 3 thirds to the 11 thirds, which gives you 14 thirds. And then you multiply by the reciprocal, 3 fourteenths. Um, plus, uh, you already have that 2 there. You add 1 to the exponent, 11 thirds. Um, multiply by the reciprocal, 3 elevenths. 
times 2 minus the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Don't forget the plus c. Um, you can clean up the 2 times the 3 elevenths, and that becomes 6 elevenths. And there is your final cleaned up answer. Again, you have a product here. Um, easiest is best. So you only have two techniques, algebra and um, U substitution. So is there some algebra that I could do here? Well, you should, uh, if we distribute, you should know that the secant is the reciprocal of the, cosec of the cosine. And so that when I multiply reciprocals, I end up with one. And when you multiply the secant times the tangent, nothing nice happens, but you get secant x, tangent x, and dx. You should now recognize that both of these terms are basic antiderivatives. What do I take the derivative of to get 1? That would just be x. We're integrating with respect to x. And so then what do I take the derivative of to get secant x tangent x? Well, that's also a basic antiderivative. Um, that would be the secant. And don't forget the plus c. You should be trying these on your own, pausing the video. This will make it a lot more interesting. Um, just sitting here watching me do problems is not very conducive to learning. Okay. In section 5.3, we talked about um, dealing with products using a U substitution. So a couple things that are going to trigger, uh, uh, let you know that you're going to use a U substitution is, you know, if you have a product, right? We don't have a product rule. Now, in the last example, we could do some algebra. There's no, there was, there's no algebra to do here. There's nothing that we can do here uh, to clean this up, to make it look like a basic antiderivative. Uh, this stems from the uh, chain rule, um, and so one of the things that you should look for is you should look for an inside function. The cosine of x is inside the e to the function, and so then u could be the cosine of x, but what else you need is you need the derivative of that function to be there as a factor. Up to a constant, if it's not exactly equal, that's fine. Um, it could just be missing a constant. So then du, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine of x, dx. And now we I solve for what is there, right? So when you look at your integrand, I have a sine of x and a dx. So I take this expression over this equation over here and rewrite it so that I have just sine of x dx on one side. And the way I'm going to do that is by multiplying both sides by negative one. Right, and so then um, this becomes negative du is equal to uh, sine of x dx. So then now for the sine of x dx that I have underlined, I can replace that with negative du. The negative I can bring outside, the du stays inside. And then um, everywhere I see a cosine of x, I can replace it with u. Right, and so there's a cosine of x right here. We're going to replace that with u. And now we have a basic antiderivative. And so then we end up with negative e to the u plus c. The only problem is, is I gave you a function in x, which means I need, I expect to see an, a function in x. So you're not done. You need to go and re, re, um, rewrite this. And so then this is negative e to the, u is the same thing as cosine of x, so we replace it with cosine of x plus c. All right, so if you don't go back to x, you're going to lose a point for not uh, giving me a function in x when I gave you a function in x. And so there you go. All right, so again, make an appropriate substitution to transform the indefinite integral into a basic indefinite integral. You're looking for an inside function. So your inside function, u is equal to, 
Now, um, if we just let u equal x to the fourth, then um, du will be 4x cubed. Um, but then I still have that 5 there. And when I go and I substitute this in, um, I will have the square root of 5 plus u. Um, and, and that's not a basic derivative. Uh, letting u be the uh, x to the fourth plus 5 doesn't change anything on my du. Letting u equal x to the fourth plus 5, my du is still 4x cubed dx. Again, I solve for what's there. What is there is an x cubed times a dx. And um, so then I want just x cubed dx over here. And I can get that by dividing both sides by 4. And so now I can make the substitution that wherever I see um, x cubed dx, I can replace it with du over 4. So then this becomes uh, the, the, the x cubed, the x cubed dx becomes um, du over 4 and the 1 quarter we can bring outside. And then um, the 5 plus x to the 4th becomes u, uh, but rather than writing the square root of u, we can write u to the 1 half. Now it's a basic power function. Now we can use the power function rule, add 1 to the exponent, 3 halves, multiply by the reciprocal, 2 thirds plus c. Here you're just multiplying, so you can multiply those two fractions together by reducing here and then uh, you get one sixth. Um, instead of u to the three halves, uh, u is x to the fourth plus five. To the three halves, and don't forget the plus c. And there we are. Uh, make an appropriate substitution to transform the indefinite integral into a basic indefinite integral. The uh, What you're looking for is an inside function. There is an inside function. The derivative of this, right, so this is really x to the negative 1. The derivative is negative 1 x to the negative 2, um, which is uh, x to the negative 2 is 1 over x squared, and that's what we have. We have 1 over x squared right here. We have this extra 3, not a big deal. Um, that extra 3 doesn't change anything, really. Okay, it's just a constant. We can bring it outside. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to let u be. Show our work over here. u is equal to uh, x to the negative 1. So then du is negative x to the negative 2 dx. Uh, this x squared under dx, or dx over x squared, that's the same thing as x to the negative 2 dx. We have this extra negative, though, so we could multiply both sides by negative 1. And so then we end up with negative du is equal to dx over x squared, if you wanted to write it that way. So that's what we have right there, the dx over x squared. We can replace that with negative. The negative and the one-third, we can bring that out. And now we just have the sine, uh, instead of 1 over x, x to the negative 1 of u du. And what do I take the derivative of to get the sine? Uh, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, um, but we want uh, just the sine. So we have an extra negative, and then we have this negative one-third. Don't forget the plus c. You can skip this step and just write down the answer. I have no problem with that. If you're um, if you're just writing down the answer, then I'm going to assume that you uh, either punched this into the uh, into a calculator or looked online and found the answer that way. I expect to see work, right? 
you can skip a step or two. If you skip all the steps, I'm not giving you any credit. So the negative times the negative is a positive, one third uh, cosine, and u is one over x plus c. From there, we went backwards and went to section 5.1. And in section 5.1, we went over how to approximate the area under the curve. Now, um, if I see, if I give you something like use four rectangles to approximate the area under the curve, then there's absolutely no need for summation notation. There's only four terms, right? The point of this problem is for you to have an understanding of what you're doing and not just plugging stuff into formulas, right? And there's only four terms, no need for summation notation, right? So the very first thing you have to do is figure out how wide each rectangle is, right? So the width, delta x, we're only going to use um, even-sized rectangles. Uh, we're not going. We're not going to allow for the general uh, Riemann sum, which uh, which allows with uh, rectangles of arbitrary widths. We're going to allow only uh, the same size rectangles, right? We're only going to use the same size rectangles. And so, how you find how do you find those? You just take the length of your interval, two minus zero. That gives you the length of the interval, and you divide by how many rectangles you're going to make. So each rectangle has a width of one half. You're going over the interval from 0 to 2, so that means your first rectangle is going to start at 0, and you go up by 1 half. So this right here is 1 half. Then um, the next one goes from 1 half to 1. You go up by a half. Then you go up by another half to 3 halves. And then you go up by another half, you'll end up at the 2, right? You use four rectangles. Um, your, your book and other books uh, allow for using different endpoints, using the left endpoint, the right endpoint, or even the middle, um, because some of them give better approximations. I, I'm trying to keep things simple, and we're just using the right endpoint. And so then um, when I ask you to do this, we're only going over the right endpoint. So your rectangle, uh, to find the height of your rectangle, you start At your right endpoint, you go up to the curve, you stop at the curve, you go over, and that's your first rectangle. One, go over, and there you go, three halves, go over, and then two. So the height of your rectangles comes from putting in the right endpoint into your formula. So then the area, there's only four. No need for a um, summation notation. So the area is, uh, the for area of the first rectangle has a width of one half and a height of, you put it into the formula, square root of one half plus two plus for the second rectangle uh, you're going to uh, the width is still just this rectangle right here the width they're all the same widths one half and the way you find your height is you put the the one into your formula so you get the square root of one plus two plus the third rectangle, the, uh, the width is 1 half, and the height, you're going to put the 3 halves into your formula, into this formula right here. That's where I'm getting this. The, the 3 halves goes into there and becomes the square root of 3 halves plus 2. And then finally, for the last one, for this rectangle right here, um, you're going to have a width of 1 half and a height of the square root of 2. plus two. The rest of it is just calculator work. Um, and you just punch this into your calculator. No need for summation notation, only four terms. You could put that in all on your home screen. I put this into my calculator. You need to know how to use your calculator. So it's a good idea to practice this. And what I'm getting 
is uh, 6.17. Round it to the hundredths place. If I don't tell you, it doesn't say where to round it to. It's not an exact number. So we um, round it to wherever you feel reasonable. Um, hundredths place seems good to me. If you did the tenths or the thousandths, I wouldn't mind. Um, the whole number place doesn't really make sense. If you, sh you, you should go a little farther than that. Okay. Also expect you to be able to do this. Use 100 rectangles to approximate the area under the curve over the interval from 1 to 9. All right. So now we want to use 100 rectangles. Now, here you will have 100 terms. Um, I'm not going to draw out all 100 terms. I'm going to draw out 4 or 5. And from those, uh, 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 I will be able to... Um, I will be able to get my pattern, right? So um, we're going from one to nine, right? So first thing I gotta do is figure out how wide is each rectangle going to be. The delta x is going to be however long your interval is, nine minus one, divided by however many rectangles you want to make, 100. And nine minus one is eight. Eight over 100 reduces down to You can divide them both by 4, and you get 2 over 25. Okay. And a couple ways to do this. Um, so you're going to start over here at 1. Let's say 1 is over here. Wow. Uh, yeah, let's say 1 is over here. Okay. Um, this is just for picture wise it's not drawn to scale um, so then that is one your width is 2 over 25 so the next one is going to be uh, 1 plus 2 over 25 and so then um, 1 plus 2 over 25 25 over 25 is 1 is going to be 27 over 25 so you're adding 1 so you're adding 25 over 25 the next one goes from 27 over 25 to, um, you're going to add another uh, 2 over 25, which is then going to be 29 over 25. You're then going to add another 2 over 25, which is 31 over 25. The next one is going to be um, 33 over 25, and so on, right? And so that should be enough for you to realize that since every time you're just adding 2 over 25, um, the numerators are just going up by 2, and the denominator staying fixed at 25, right? And so for your first rectangle, you're going to put in the 27 over 25 into your formula to figure out your height. You're going to go over, and there you go. Uh, for the second one, you're going to put in the 29 over 25. You're going to go over, and there you go. For the next one, you're going to put in the 31 over 25, and you get that rectangle, and then 33 over 25. There's 100 of them, right? And uh, maybe I should put a little break here um, because uh, that's, they're not all. Th th this distance here is 1, but this distance here is not 1. It's only 2 over 25. This is just for you to see, visualize what's going on here. And so then your area using 100 rectangles um, is going to be um, the area of this first rectangle, which is a width of 2 over 25 times a height. And the height we get by putting the 27 over 25 into this formula. And so the formula then um, becomes the square root of 27 over 25 um, plus 2. Same thing. Now we're putting the 29 for the second rectangle, this rectangle right here. We are now putting the 29 over 25 into the formula to get my height. The width is still the same, 2 over 25 square root of 29 over 25 plus 2. Plus, for the third rectangle, 
um, where the width is still 2 over 25. And uh, the height we get we find by taking the square root of uh, 27 over 25. Sorry, 29 over 20. No, 31. Plus 2. And then for the last one that I have drawn here, um, it's going to be the same 2 over 25 uh, square root of 33 over 25 plus 2. And plus dot, 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 and so on until we get to um, that hundredth rectangle. And I'm not going to draw a hundred of them. But this does allow me to see patterns, right? Uh, if you look, every single term, I only wrote four terms, but from there we can get our pattern. Um, every single term, so we have the summation, and we have a hundred terms that we're going to have because we have a hundred rectangles, one for every rectangle. So we go from I equals um, one to one hundred. And then um, every single term has a 2 over 25 in front of it. That doesn't change. Inside the parentheses, every single term has a square root. Plus 2. Um, but in, inside the square root, you have a 25 in the denominator for all of them. And then... Um, you have 27, uh, 29, 31, 33. They're all going up by 2. And so that has to something to do with the multiples of 2. So this should be 2i. But when i is 1, we want to get 27. So if we add 25, then that will work. Uh, 2i, uh, 2 times 1 is 2, plus 25 is 27. 2 times 2 is 2. I'm sorry, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 25 is 29. That gives us that one. Uh, 2 times 3 is 6, plus 25 is 31. That gives us that one. And then so on. So this is summation notation. I expect you to be able to use your calculator. Um, no need to go and do this by hand. That was the whole point of writing it some in summation notation. And so then, um, again, you go to second list on your calculator. You go to math. And then you scroll down to number five. And then you go to second list again. And then you go to ops. And then you go to five again. And now you have some sequence, right? And so then your uh, now you put in your formula. Your uh, terms are 2 divided by 25. And then you have the square root. And inside the square root, you have two terms in the numerator. So you need the, the calculator automatically puts a parenthesis there. You have to put in another parenthesis. And then um, in the numerator, you have 2x plus 25. Close the uh, no, close the parentheses because that's all that's in the numerator. And then you divide it by 25. And then you close the second parentheses because that's all you're square rooting. The 25 is the last thing you were square rooting. Um, but then you still have the plus 2. And so then you close the parentheses that you... Uh, ooh, I missed the parentheses. Um, after the 2 divided by 25, you needed a parenthesis after the 25. So I hit second, insert, put the parenthesis there. Now I have 2 divided by 25, parenthesis. And the reason for that parenthesis, that first parenthesis, is that corresponds to this parenthesis right here. This parenthesis right here. Okay, so I believe I've put that in correctly now. I hit comma. Um, tell it the, what the name of my variable is, x, comma, tell it what my first term is, 1, 
comma, tell it what my last term is, 100. Hit enter. And um, the problem is telling me 33.41. And there we go. So the problem told me 33.41. And we're good to go. Okay, so from there we went on to, okay, well, how do I get better approximations? More rectangles, right? And so then, um, well, we could use more rectangles by taking the limit as n goes off to infinity. And so that's definition of the area under a curve. If the function f is continuous on a, b, and if f of x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in a, b, then the area a under the curve, y equals f of x over the interval a, b, is defined by a is equal to the limit as n goes off to infinity. And so then um, what we want to do is we want to uh, find a closed form formula for this sum so that we could then... Um, figure out um, what the uh, uh, limit is, right? We can't, can't find that limit in summation notation. We have to find a closed form formula. And so then we find closed form formulas using some formulas that I gave you, right? So we have the summation from k equals 1 to n of k squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all divided by 6. So we begin this problem. Um, to me, it's 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 nice to make a quick graph. You should recognize that this is just the standard parabola that's reflected across the x-axis and raised up nine. You should quickly see that this is going to cross the x-axis over here at three, and you're trying to find the area over the interval from zero to three, right? And so, again, the very first step is to figure out um, uh, how wide each rectangle is going to be. But what we're going to do is we're not going to use 10 rectangles or 100 rectangles or even 1,000. Um, we're going to use n rectangles. So then delta x is going to be um, 3 minus 0, the width of the interval, divided by n. So that's 3 over n. So then your first rectangle will start at 0 and end at 3 over n. Your next rectangle will start at 3 over n and end at 6 over n. Your next one will end at 9 over n, and so on. Right? And so then you're going to make these rectangles. There's n of them. I only drew 3 because that's really all I need to get my pattern. Right? And so for the first, so the area using n rectangles is going to be the width of the rectangle. 3 over n, and we want to first figure out what's the width of this rectangle right here. And I'm sorry, the height of that rectangle. And so to do that, we're going to put in that right endpoint, the 3 over n, and we're going to put it into the formula. That's where our heights come from by putting the right endpoint into this formula. And so then we get 9 minus 3 over n squared. We're going to not clean it up. Just going to leave it like that so that it'll be easier to see a uh, pattern. Okay, so then the next rectangle um, has a width of 3 over n. And the height, again, this height goes, we get from putting this right endpoint into the formula to figure out how high it is, how far it is from there to there. And so when we put that into the formula, we get 9 minus 6 over n squared. And then the third one, I'll just do three of them. That's I don't have a whole lot of room, and that's enough for me to get my pattern. Uh, 3 over n, 
Um, and then now for this third rectangle, I'm going to put the 9 over n into this formula right here. Right? And so then when I put that in there, I get 9 minus uh, 9 over n squared, and so on. And now we want to write this using summation notation. Uh, so this becomes the summation from i equals 1 to n, because we are not using 10 or 100 or 1,000. We're using n rectangles, right? This is the area using n rectangles. And so then, um, then each one has a 3 over n. And then if you look inside here, uh, they all have a 9 minus and then a parenthesis and then a square. And then inside the square is a fraction. And that one's 3 over n, 6 over n, 9 over n. Because you keep, you're just going up by 3 over n each time, it should be clear that um, what is going to generate the numerators is 3i. And the denominator is always n. So now we can start doing some cleanup. This will be the summation from i equals 1 to n of distribute. Uh, well, let me clean up the inside before I distribute 3 over n, 9 minus um, 9i squared over n squared. And then. Go ahead and erase some of this right here. And then um, we get the summation from i equals 1 to n of distribute the 3 over n, and you'll get 27 over n minus 27i squared over n cubed. And now we want to uh, write a closed form formula for this, right? So that we can take the limit. So um, we're going to use this uh, formula up here, this one here. And so I ran, I've run out of room here, so let me go on. Okay, so um, now what we can do Yep. Now what we can do is, um, here's where I left off. We have the summation from i equals 1 to n of 27 over n minus 27i squared over n cubed. And then we can break this up into two summations. The summation from i equals 1 to n of 27 over n minus the summation from i equals 1 to n of 27i squared over n cubed. Now, um, the counter is i. Anything that doesn't have an i in it is a um, constant, and we can pull it out. So then this will give us the summation from i equals 1 to n. This is all a constant. We can bring that out, 27 over n, leaving behind just 1. Minus, uh, from this one, the uh, 27 over n cubed is a constant, and then we have i squared. And so if you're adding up n ones, you get n. So that right there is n. So the first one becomes 27 over n times n minus uh, 27 over n cubed times. Uh, if you're adding up all the i squareds, that's the formula I gave you you end up with uh, n times n, uh, n plus 1 
times 2n plus 1. All divided by 6. Here, the ends cancel. And we end up with 27. Minus, here, one of the ends cancel. And we could also reduce with this 6 and this 27. Dividing them both by 3 will give me a 2 here and a 9 here. And so we end up with uh, 9 times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all divided by 2n squared. And so then um, what we have here is a closed form formula for the area using n rectangles. The area using n rectangles is given to you by this expression, 27 minus n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all divided by 2n squared. So this formula here, you tell me how many rectangles you want to use, I plug them into that formula, I give you the approximation. But I'm not looking for an approximation, I'm looking for the exact area. So to find the exact area, we take the limit as n goes off to infinity of the a sub n, which is the limit as n goes off to infinity of 27 minus 9 times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. I could have worked all this out, but no, there's really no need. I'll divide it by 2n squared. You should see that um, if I were to expand the numerator, um, the degree would be a square. The denominator, the degree, is also a square. So when I have that, the limit is going to be uh, the leading coefficient of the numerator, uh, 18n squared is going to be the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator, 2. So 18 over 2 is 9. So 9, 27 minus 9, which is 18. Okay, so um, there we go. So if I tell you to use the definition, this is the definition. If instead you use the fundamental theorem of calculus, find an antiderivative, evaluate it, the endpoints, and subtract, um, then I will only give you partial credit, and probably uh, just a couple points for not leaving it blank. So you need to make sure that you understand the question, understand what I'm asking you to do, and do it. We moved on to section 5.5, and in section 5.5, we didn't yet get to the fundamental theorem of calculus. We just got into um, the definite integral. An indefinite integral is uh, finding an antiderivative, a general antiderivative. The definite integral um, is uh, uh, trying to find the area under the curve, and the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, connects the two. Um, right, but in section 5.5, we're just going over the notation and all the how, how all that works. Um, and so, use theorem 5.5.4 and approximate and appropriate formulas from geometry to evaluate the integrals. So, in this problem, even with the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can't do this problem analytically, you can't find an antiderivative. We're not going to go over the techniques to do that in this class. We will be able to do this in 5b. But you, if you know what it means geometrically, then you can do the problem. So first thing, though, is um, if you look at this graph, this won't be a graph that you may necessarily be comfortable with uh, and be able to find it. So instead, what we can do is we can, again, break this up into the integral from 0 to 1 of x dx. That's a basic, uh, that's just a line. We can find the area under a line not too not, not with not too much difficulty and then we have the definite integral from um 0 to 1 uh, and we can take out the constant of 2 the square root of 1 minus x squared dx and what you should realize is that um this is just 
geometrically the area under the line over the interval from 0 to 1. And we can get this value by just the area is 1 half the base times the height. The base is 1. The height is 1. And so that's it. That's it. Now, this part right here, you should recognize that that is the, uh, that that is the area in the first quadrant of a circle. right? So the square root of 1 minus x squared turns out to be a circle of radius 1. Uh, actually, a half circle. And you're only going over the interval from 0 to 1, so you're just trying to find the area there. And so then what you get there is 2 times 1 quarter of the area of the circle, which is pi times the radius, but the radius is 1, squared. And so then that works out to 1 half plus pi over 2. Right? So can't do everything analytically. So you need to make sure that you can um, look at the problem correctly. Uh, in section 5.6, we learn the fundamental theorem of calculus, part 1. If f is continuous on AB and capital F is any antiderivative of f on AB, then the definite integral from A to B of f of x dx is f of B minus f of A. So basically what this theorem tells you is to find the definite integral the area under the curve, um, you can find any antiderivative at all, evaluate it at the endpoints and subtract, and that value will be your uh, definite integral, the value of your definite integral. So when we're doing a problem like this, um, no need to use rectangles and find a closed form formula for all this, because that would take all day. Um, you can just find the antiderivative each of these terms is a power function. We find the antiderivative by adding one to the exponent, dividing by the exponent, adding one to the exponent, dividing by the exponent, adding one to the exponent, dividing by the exponent, and then we evaluate this from zero to six. When we plug in six, we end up with, I don't need to see the arithmetic. You can do that on your calculator. 6 raised to the third power divided by 3 is 72. Minus 3 times 36 108 plus 8 times 6 48. And so then we have 72 minus 108 plus 48, 12. Um, so um, when we plug in 0, we get 0. So this should really be minus 0. This works out to be just 12. If you look at this graph on your graphing calculator, the graph is a parabola. It crosses the x-axis over here and here, and 6 is over here. Um, you're finding the net signed area is what this is doing. And so all of this area here is positive. All of this area here is positive. But then you have this area down here that is negative. And this is not giving you the uh, total area. It's giving you uh, the net area where some of this positive area is canceled out by some of this negative area. And all this is telling you is that you have 12 more uh, area units than you have negative area units. Um, it's kind of in the name, um, and so we've been working with antiderivatives and integration, and you then you do definite integration by finding an antiderivative, 
So the fundamental theorem of calculus part two just tells you that these really are reverse processes. And if you do one and then the other, you end up right back where you started. If f is continuous on an interval, then f has an antiderivative on that interval in particular. If a is any point in the interval, then the function f defined by f of x is equal to the definite integral from a to x of f of t dt is an antiderivative of f. That is, f prime of x is equal to f of x for each x in the interval. Or in alternative notation, um, the derivative of, uh, of this function is just the function you started with, right? So um, sometimes um, you know something about the rate of growth. So you know the derivative, but you don't know what the original function is and you can't find a simple antiderivative. So what you can do is you can define a function using this, that your function is defined as the definite integral from a to x. Now, there's no x here, and this is, this is a dummy variable, uh, f of t dt. Um, wouldn't make sense to have the same variable down here and up here. Can't do that, right? And so then we have these dummy, this dummy variable. Um, but if I take this weird function and then find its derivative, which is what I'm doing here, uh, what I should get is the original function I started with since um, derivatives and antiderivatives are reverse processes of each other. Now, um, that kind of, that's a little abstract for some people, but it's really just that. If you take a step forward and then a step back, where do you end up? Right back where you started, right? So integration and differentiation are reverse processes. So if you integrate and then differentiate, you end up right back where you started. So there's absolutely no work to do here. In this part right here, to form your function, you're integrating the function one over one plus the square root of t. But um, you're, you're uh, so this is a function in x, right? And so then when I differentiate it, I should end up right back with the function I started with, one over one plus the square root of x, right? It's a function in x, you're differentiating with respect to x. Now, if you if you try to integrate this and find an antiderivative, you may not be able to. You may, um, but why would you want to, right? If you take a step forward and a step back, you don't physically have to take it. You know you're going to end up right back where you started. Now, this one, you might be able to come up with an antiderivative. I can look at it and see that a u substitution would help us. Uh, but this one here, I, we, we'll, we, we'll be able to do that next semester. Can't do it now, but I don't have to. I'm, t I'm taking the derivative of this antiderivative. So I should end up right back at the original function, natural log of x. And that's it. There's no work to show. Let's move on. Okay, so um, before we started with the position function, took the derivative, got the velocity function, took the derivative of that, got the acceleration function. And now that uh, so one of the things that people always ask when I'm talking about antiderivatives is why do we want to go backwards? Well, suppose we know the acceleration, then we could use the antiderivative to find the velocity. And then we could use the antiderivative of the velocity to find the um, position. So it turns out from physics um, that near the surface of the Earth, uh, if you ignore wind resistance, it makes absolutely no difference how big or small uh, an object is. Its acceleration due to gravity is about the same no matter uh, where you are. And it will always be about negative 32 feet per second squared or 9.8 meters per second squared, All right? And so then here we have this uh, problem. A rock tossed downward from a height of 112 feet reaches the ground in two seconds. What is the initial velocity? So we want to know what is the initial velocity. Okay, so if, if it's not obvious where to start with this, uh, if you just leave it blank, um, then you get a big fat zero. But if you start doing some work that's relevant, um, then you can um, then you can earn some points, right? So again, 
Um, first thing we know is that uh, the acceleration is just gravity, which is negative 32 feet per second squared. All right, and since we're using feet, we're going to use this one, not this one. Well, to find the velocity, we integrate, find the antiderivative, and it's negative 32 plus c, right? What is the initial velocity? That's this c right here. But we're not given an input-output pair to, the, to just stop there, right? We have to move forward and then uh, find the position function. So the position function, we find the antiderivative, which is negative 16t squared plus ct plus d. Um, but the rock was tossed downward from a height of 112 feet. So if it was to uh, tossed downward from a height of 112 feet, then um, that means that when time was zero, my height was 112. So this gives me the input-output pair for the position of 0, 112. Okay, so then we can put that into this formula. 112 is equal to d. doesn't matter what c is. When you put 0 in for t, both these terms go away, and you get d is 112. So now you know that your position is negative 16 t squared plus c times t plus 112. Okay. The question is asking, um, what is the initial velocity, right? Um, and if you notice, we've given you've been given another input-output pair. So a rock tossed downward from a height of 112 feet reaches the ground in two seconds. So that's another input-output pair, but for the position, not for the velocity, not for the acceleration. Um, it's for the position. That's telling you that um, when your time is two seconds, where are you if, uh, you, or if you've hit the ground? What is your height above the ground? So that actually is giving you a position of zero, right? So two, zero. So now we can go ahead and put in zero for the output and then put in two for my time. Two squared is four times negative 16 is negative 64 plus 2c plus 112. So 112 minus 64 is 48. And then we can um, subtract 48 from both sides. Negative 48 is equal to 2c. Divide that by 2. And c is equal to negative 24. And you can see that um, what is the initial velocity, that is the velocity that corresponds to time t equaling 0. And so c is the initial velocity. We just figured out that c is negative 24. And so it's negative 24 feet per second. Uh, section 5.8, we talked about the average value of a function over an interval. And so then the average value of the a function over an interval is just 1 over the width of the interval times the definite integral from a to b of the function. Right. And so for this problem, um, w w or the width of my interval is 1 over the natural log of 5 plus 1 uh, times the definite integral from a to b, negative 1 to the natural log of 5 of e to the x dx. The antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. And we're going to evaluate that from negative 1 to the natural log of 5. Um, when we evaluate e to the x at natural log of 5, we just get 5. And when we evaluate it at negative 1, we get 1 over e. 
And so there we go. That's our average value. <laughs> Last section, uh, section 5.9. Um, we're evaluating definite integrals uh, using u substitutions, right? So these these functions here, we can't find these antiderivatives just uh, the, um, by looking at them. They're not basic antiderivatives. We have to do a u substitution. And again, what I am going to do is I'm going to change my limits of integration so that I don't have to go back to x. I can just use u. So again, you look for an inside function, sine of 3x. Uh, and you're hoping that its derivative is there as a factor. The derivative of the sine is the cosine, and that's what we have there, right? So u is equal to the sine of 3x. Uh, du is equal to, uh, the derivative of the sine is the cosine, same inside, but then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now we don't have the 3. We have cosine of 3x dx. So then uh, du over 3 is equal to uh, cosine of 3x dx. So then we transform this integral, replacing the cosine of 3x dx with du over 3. The 1 third comes to the outside. Um, then we have e to the u. Um, but again, these are... Um, x values and we now have an integral in u uh, but this formula tells me how to take my x values and turn them into u values 3 times 0 is 0 sine of 0 is 0 so 0 stays 0 uh, but pi over 6 3 times pi over 6 is pi over 2 and the sine of pi over 2 is 1 so then this becomes 1 and so then this is 1 third uh, e to the u evaluated from 0 to 1. 1 third e to the 1 is 1. I'm sorry, e to the 1 is e. e to the 0 is 1. And there you go. Okay, so evaluate the definite integral. Again, um, you have a product, no no product rule. Um, there's no algebra that I can do to help clean this up. So then we look for an inside function. Uh, here, uh, the inside function is u equals x plus 3. And the problem with that is that du is dx. And then when we go and replace uh, the x plus 3 with u, and the du with dx, um, we st will still have an extra x, right? So you need to be careful um, because we're going to have a du, so we're going to need everything to be in terms of u. We can't have this x there. But we have this formula up here that relates x and u. So we can just subtract 3 from both sides and see that x is equal to u minus 3. So then, making all those substitutions, um, the x plus 3 then becomes uh, u, so we get u to the 1 half because it's being square rooted. And the dx becomes du, so there we go. And we still have this 2, and um, the x is u minus 3. Then we have the definite integral from 1 to 6. Those are x values. We need to make them u values. Um, but u is x plus 3, so 1 plus 3 is 4, and 6 plus 3 is 7. Okay, now still have a product, but now we can distribute, we can distribute the 2u to the 1 half, and so then this becomes the definite integral from 4 to 7 of 2u to the 3 halves uh, minus 6 u to the one-half du. Now we have two basic antiderivatives. Um, add one to the exponent. 
and u to the 5 halves multiplied by the reciprocal uh, 2 fifths, but there's already a 2 there, so you get 4 fifths. Um, add 1 to the exponent, u to the 3 halves multiplied by the reciprocal 2 thirds, uh, but there's already a 6 there. So you end up with 4. And you're going to evaluate this from 4 to 7. I don't know where I got 7 from. u is x plus 3. And so if my x is 6, 6 plus 3 is 9. So that should be a 9. That should be a 9. And that should be a 9. And so then we end up with 4 fifths times 9 to the 5 halves minus 4 times 9 to the 3 halves minus uh, 4 fifths times 4 to the 5 halves, minus 4 times 4 to the 3 halves. Uh, putting all that into the calculator, I got 92.8.